Section two, basic concepts. In this section, we're going to look at those the three statements in a bit more detail. The balance sheet, why does it balance? Why is it called the balance sheet? The income statement and the cash flow statement, why are they different? How do they treat transactions differently? We will use that to bring us into the accrual concept, which is basically that difference between the two of those statements. And we will then conclude this section by looking at international financial reporting standards or some of those rules that dictate how the accounts are put together. So we begin with the balance sheet. So the balance sheet is split into two parts or three parts depending on how you split it. There are also different variations in different parts of the world but essentially the balance sheet will always have two totals that match. In this diagram you can see it's the assets and the liabilities and equity. So let's describe these fairly briefly initially. We're going to go into much more depth later on. The assets are resources owned or controlled by the firm. All the positive things for the company. So think what the company may own. It owns cash sitting in the bank. It owns inventory sitting in the warehouse. It's got what are called accounts receivable or debtors, customers that owe them money. It's got plant and equipment, it's got buildings. It may have intangibles, it may have brands and patents. Um, what else? It may have investments in other companies. So, I mean, they're the main sections, but there are lots of different things. They are positive things that we hope will bring value to the company in the future. Offsetting that, you've got the liabilities. Liabilities are claims by outsiders on those assets, negative assets, if you like. So now we've got an overdraft, we owe the bank some money, we've got, we've got bonds, we'll talk about bonds later on, but a bond, the company has borrowed money from the markets and needs to pay them back. The company may have a lease, they've bought, they, they are using an asset but need to make payments on that for the next five years. They have got other payables, they owe their suppliers some money, accounts payable or creditors, uh, and we'll see other examples as well. So the liabilities offset the assets, and assuming the assets are bigger than the liabilities, which isn't always the case, but for, for healthy companies it is, then the difference is what is called equity. So assets minus liabilities equals equity. Equity is the net worth of the company, it's the book value. When we talk about book value, it means the balance sheet, what is in the accounts. And the equity represents the ownership of the business. This is where the shares are. This is called shareholders funds or stockholders equity or variations on that depending where we are in the world. And it's defined as total assets minus total liabilities. Now that immediately tells you that it has to balance. But the question is, why does it balance? And we're going to get do lots of examples to see why it is that equity must equal assets minus liabilities, or that assets must equal uh, liabilities plus equity. So your fundamental accounting equation, assets equals liabilities plus equity, shown at the bottom of that slide, that is your fundamental building block, your first main axiom of accounting, that all your assets in the business, they have either been funded by owing other people money, or by the shareholders, or by past profits, and we'll see how all that fits into the balance sheet. So assets equals liabilities plus equity, very, very important. Now I said you will see different variations uh, if you look at different accounts in the real world. You may, for example, see assets minus liabilities, and then the total of those assets minus liabilities is called net assets, and then that equals equity. So you can rearrange the equation, but it will always be one thing equals another thing. Now, we're going to be using this diagram a lot over this course, and as long as you learn accounting with Quartic, you will find that this little box, this matchstick diagram, comes up all over the place, and you'll find it's a very useful way of learning how the accounting works. Now, we're not going to be doing detailed accounting. We're not going to be doing uh, T accounts and double entry bookkeeping, though they will be mentioned. But the point of this little statement, this little box diagram, is it helps us get to the right answer without having to learn, have, without spending months learning to do all the bookkeeping, all the detailed bookkeeping. So you're going to see that diagram a lot. The income statement. Now this is where we show the revenue and the expenses. Um, this varies enormously, how long it is, how many numbers are in this, what level of depth it goes to. But we start off with what we hope is the biggest number, and that is revenues. So revenues, also known as sales, also known as turnover. 
and revenues represent the value of everything sold to customers in the year. Now, note that we're not talking about cash flow. If our year end is December, and we make a sale to a customer during December, we sell widgets. We sell things that we've made. When we talk about a widget, a widget is just a thing. It could be one of these things. It could be all sorts of things, anything. But we make a thing that we sell to customers. And if a customer makes a purchase from us in December, but we're giving them a month's credit, then they may not pay us until January. So the income statement still shows that transaction. We still show the transaction, we've made the sale, we have the costs associated with it, even though we haven't got the cash. So that's the income statement. Revenues and sales represent the top, the biggest number, hopefully, on the income statement. We then subtract costs one at a time. So the first cost is COGS, or cost of goods sold, or sometimes cost of sales. This is the direct cost of producing those widgets. So whatever the widgets are, widget is just an accounting term. It's used by accountants to mean a thing of whatever shape and size it happens to be. So we are selling these widgets and the cost of producing them goes into cost of sales. And those costs are going to include the raw materials. They may include a bit of labor cost, a bit of, um, a, a bit of other costs and other direct inputs into the manufacturing process. So they are the cost of sales, it's the direct cost of producing those goods. Subtract those from the revenues, you get the gross profit. And the gross profit therefore represents how much profit has been made by selling all these items during the year. Now, that doesn't take into account all the other costs, all the overheads yet, and that goes into operating expenses. So the operating expenses include all the other costs of running the business, so you've got all the costs of salaries of people working in the office. You've got the rent on the premises. You've got all the other costs. You've got what, something called depreciation. And depreciation is a very important concept that we're going to talk about, um, that, we, that we're going to talk about over and over again in the coming sections. Pause. Stylus has stopped working. change the battery sorry I didn't you can just forward through this bit if you're a student this is how to change your battery I hope you're not listening to this if you're a student they don't last very long So depreciation is part of operating expenses. This is the rate at which assets diminish in value. Let's suppose we buy a machine for £10,000 and we think it's going to last 10 years. Then that machine is going to reduce in value from 10000 let's say it's down to zero, and let's say it's even over its life. So every year that value is going to drop from 10000 9000 8000 and it loses a 1000 of value every year. That's the depreciation. We'll see in more detail how that works later. But the depreciation represents the diminution of value of the long-term assets. So that's part of operating expenses. Then you get down to operating profit, also known as EBIT. EBIT is earnings before interest and tax. Now, operating profit and EBIT are not quite the same thing. For the purposes of this, uh, for the purposes of this discussion, they are close enough, but occasionally you get something that's in between them after operating profit, but before EBIT. But for the most part, we can treat them as the same for most of the analysis we're going to be doing. So operating profit is 
what you see looking through the factory window. In other words, revenues down to operating profit is the functioning of the business. You've got all the costs of running the business in there. What you haven't got are the corporate costs. Now, what I mean by the corporate costs, you can see here financing costs, which means interest and tax. That's to do with the structure of the company. So that's the legal side, if you like. So down to EBIT, we've got the operations, all the functioning of the business. You then, you then subtract interest. If the company has got borrowed money, then financing costs will be subtracting the interest from that. If the company's got money on deposit, then that'll be a finance gain. It'll be, a, it'll be an income, finance income, interest received. But the financing costs, you're saying we've got borrowed money, therefore that takes us from EBIT, earnings before interest and tax, down to EBT, earnings after interest but still before tax. So earnings before tax is pre-tax earnings or pre-tax income, called different things, but it means the profit that the company's made after everyone's taken what they need except the government. And so we've now paid the interest to the bank, or to the bondholders, we now need to pay the tax to the government. And so income tax expense comes next, and after that, you're left with net income or earnings after tax. So net income down the bottom. It's just worth the thought at this stage. Who owns that? The shareholders own that. If you own the shares of the company, then you own everything the company has got and you earn all the profits the company makes. Net income is your net profit. Profit after tax, or earnings after tax. Again, they mean the same thing. And so that profit, what's gonna happen to it? Now, some of that is gonna, pay, is gonna be paid out as dividends, because if you own the company, you may say, I want to receive some of that as income, and there's your dividends. What happens to the rest of it? The other part is kept by the company in order to grow. So this is the retained profit. And the retained profit is there so the company can get bigger, so that it can take on more premises. Uh, so retained, that's the retained profit. And through that it can grow overseas, it can, it can expand by uh, create new widgets, new different types of new premises and new machines, for example. So if you think about the net profit, you as a shareholder, own a company that's made profits, some of that maybe you want in your bank account so you can go and spend it, some of it you want the company to grow. And when we talk about capital growth of a company, it comes from those retained earnings. So the retained bit is what the company uses to expand. Let's now talk about the cash flow statement. Now this does not, this does not use what's called accruals, this uses pure cash what cash came into the company, what cash went out from the company. So it's a very objective view. A lot of analysts will rely on the cash flow statement more than they will rely on the income statement. We'll see why shortly. So the cash flow statement, purely objective. Cash comes in, it will be shown on the bank statement. Cash goes out, again, it'll be deducted on the bank statement. And if you imagine you start with last year's cash balance at 31st of December last year. And imagine going down the bank statement, taking every single number and either adding it or subtracting it to one of the categories. Then you're gonna end up with what's left at the end of the year. Now there are three categories or buckets or pigeonholes. They are the operations, the investments, and the financing. And every single cash flow will fit into one of those three. And if you take, think of it as a big reconciliation. Imagine starting with last year's bank balance. There's the opening cash position, 1st of January this year, or the end of the 31st of December last year. And imagine every single cash item, every single movement in the bank statement is allocated to one of those three, operations, investments, or financing, then if you add it up correctly and you, do, you put minus signs where it goes out and plus signs where it comes in, you must be left with what you've got at the end. So that's the closing cash balance. So your cash flows, your three lots of cash flows, will reconcile this year's cash balance to last year's cash balance. And we'll explore what goes, what goes into those three, but roughly the operations, all the functioning of the business. You're buying things, you're selling things, you're trading. The investing is when you're buying and selling long-term assets. And the financing is to do with 
the shareholders and the bondholders. So we'll go into that in more depth later, but that's the basic idea of the cash flow statement. Note that it is very objective. When we talk about the income statement, you'll see there's more subjectivity, there's more scope for management to put their will and make numbers bigger or smaller. So let's discuss the accrual concept because this is what distinguishes the this is what distinguishes the cash flow statement from the income statement. Example one, a company sells goods to a customer in late December, we're dealing with a 31st of December year end, um, giving her a month's credit. So what's happened? The earnings process, has the business genuinely benefited from the sale? Assuming it's a profitable sale, then yes, because the customer has agreed that she's gonna make payment. So she has accepted that although she's received the goods now, she hasn't paid yet, but she will pay. And therefore, the profit should be recorded this year. Now, cash flow, if she was given a month's credit, the cash won't have been received by the company yet. So at the 31st of December, the income statement needs to show that that sale was made and it needs to reflect the costs associated with it, the cost of goods sold. The cash flow statement won't show anything to do with that sale because no cash was received. So that's the difference between the two of them. So the company records the profits this year, but the cash won't happen until next year. And the difference is what we call the accrual concept. The accrual, the concept of accruals is allocating transactions to the period to which they relate. So if you make a sale in December, then that transaction relates to that year, even though the cash hasn't been received yet. If we incur an expense, then the accrual concept said that needs to go through now, even if we haven't paid that expense yet. So that's the main idea of the accrual concept. Now, let's do a second example. Um, a company buys a computer for a thousand pounds to use in its business. Now, we're buying this today, and let's say we didn't get credit on this. We literally went to the shop, we bought a 1,000 pound computer, um, and that's cash gone. So when did cash leave the bank? Now. We've paid, we've paid the money now and left our bank account this year. Was it an expense or an investment? Well, we may be in the computer trading business, but let's say we're not. This computer is for our use for the longer term. So this is not for our operations, but we're going to be using it in the business long term. It's an investing cash flow. And so it's we treat this as an investment we do not put it through the income statement immediately because the income statement shows an expense. It's not an expense. If we treated it as an expense, can you see this says the question, is this fair? Well, it's not fair, if you like, because this year you'll be showing the thousand pound cost, whereas the computer we hope is gonna last us for a number of years. Now the question is, how long will the computer last? How long do we think the computer is gonna last? Let's say we think the computer is going to last two years. So what we're going to do is we can spread the cost through our income statement in two different years. Now remember the idea of depreciation. So this computer costs us a thousand pounds now, but you can put through five hundred pounds of depreciation this year, five hundred pounds of depreciation next next year, and that's because we've guessed the computer is going to last two years. Is that, is that guess correct? I don't know. It's impossible to tell. We can go back in a few years' time. We can go in a, in a few years' time, we can look back and see if we were right. But we can't tell yet whether that was correct. So it has to be an estimate. Now, let me cast your minds back many years. My, uh, I started my career with a small accounting firm known as Pricewaterhouse um, back last century. And when I remember my very first day when I started doing the detailed accounting we would on, on this bookkeeping course. And I, like a lot of other people in the room, thought that accounting was a science. Now, you've got transaction, we buy a machine, we buy a computer, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a fact. It's factual statement, we bought this computer, therefore there must be a factual answer, how does it go into the accounts? Now, very quickly, we realize that in fact, it's an art form and not a science, actually it's a bit of a dark art. So how long does this computer last? We've guessed two years, which means depreciation, which is an expense, this year is 500 and next year is 500. I've changed my mind. I think the computer's gonna last now for four years. 
Is that right? I don't know. I've got no better idea. So, but let's make it four years instead of two years. How much is the depreciation now? Well, hopefully, you're saying it's £250, which is a quarter of a thousand. So if depreciation is now, if the computer is now spread out over four years instead of two years, then what's going to happen is this year's income statement is going to show a £250 depreciation instead of a £500 depreciation. So I've just reduced expenses by £250 from £500 to £250. That means I've just increased profit by 250 pounds as well. How easy was that? I changed my mind and made 250 pounds more profit. As I said, it's a dark art. So what we need to understand, and one of the key things we're gonna discover in this course, is that managers have choices that affect the accounts. And it is, I'm making quite a big point of this because it is important. How long this computer lasts, we don't know. We have to make an estimate, or the directors have to make an estimate, and that estimate will feed into the accounts. If we're wrong, then you may find there's a correct, there's a profit or loss some point in the future. But today, we don't know. We have to estimate. That estimate is, that estimate is going to affect this year's accounts. And as a result of that, we need to understand what the motivations are for management. Why is it they prefer to choose four years over two years? So in this case, very simply, turning, changing it from two years to four years, we make £250 more profit. Now, of course, there are consequences further down the line, which you may already be able to visualise. But you can see the choice. This is subjective. So at the accrual concept, uh, to summarise this slide, separates the income statement from the cash flow statement. The cash flow statement we said was very objective. Cash comes in, cash goes out. There are still a few choices sometimes, but for the most part, it's objective. The income statement is much more subjective. How much income, what expenses are representing this year? Using the accrual concept, we are allocating the cost to the appropriate periods, the transactions to the appropriate period. In this case, 1,000 pound computer, are we allocating it to two years or are we allocating it to four years? The difference will have an impact on the accounts. Now let's link up the two statements. So we've got, we've already talked about net income and we've already said some of that may be paid out as dividends. What happens to the rest of it? Now think about the company's balance sheet. The balance sheet represents what the company has got, what the company owes, and the net equity of the business. So if the company makes lots of profit, but pays it all out as dividends, then it can't grow. And there might still be a very good investment, but imagine you own a share of a company that's making loads of profits, paying huge dividends, but it's not, there's nothing left at the end of the year. So it's all gone to shareholders. It's still a good investment. You may be making a very good return on your investment, but the company can't grow through those profits. Now, let's say the company doesn't pay out all the profits as dividends, and most companies don't. If a company does pay out all the profits, it's, it's really limiting what it can do in the future. So let's say the company pays out, I don't know, say a third of its profits as dividends. The remaining two-thirds, we said, was retained, and that feeds into the balance sheet. So the retained earnings on the balance sheet is part of equity. Now, imagine you're a shareholder. As a shareholder, you own equity. This is your ownership. Equity represents your ownership in the business. Um, if you own all the shares, it means you control all the assets and the liabilities. But equity, equity, remember, is the book worth of the business. Now, if the company makes profit, it's going to grow. I mean, put it in very simple terms, you can buy more assets. So you can see with lots of profit, the assets on the balance sheet may grow, and the equity grows because it's saying the, book, the business is worth more. Now, within equity, we'll see a breakdown of it, um, and the retained earnings represents all the profits since the company was founded, since the company was incorporated, that have not been paid out to shareholders. So it's all the profits in history that have been retained by the company. And if the company's grown a lot over 20, 30 years, then it could be a very substantial amount. So you can see here, these two statements link together. And it's quite important because when we start doing, when we start looking at individual transactions, if a company makes a profit from a transaction, then on the balance sheet, it could be retained earnings that's affected. So we're going to do examples of this. 
but look back at this slide if you get slightly stuck and understand that if the company makes some profit on the income statement, it means the equity on the balance sheet gets bigger as a result. So let's do a few examples. And as I said, if you get stuck trying to work something out, just think, does it affect the equity on the balance sheet? So we're going to use our little, our little uh, matchstick diagram here. <clears throat> and that, that'll help us as we progress. So Boris Industries, number one, purchases some inventory on credit for 600 euros. So what have we got? We purchase some inventory. Now, inventory goes up. We've got more stock. So you can see inventory has increased by 600. Now, if you know more about accounting, uh, you may understand that inventory, the actual nuts and bolts of the accounting may be different from this. But the, what we're describing here is giving you the understanding of how it all works. In a later, more advanced course, we may go into a bit more detail on what the true accounting entries are, but that's not the purpose of this course. Now, what we've done, we've bought some inventory. The result of that is we have more inventory, which is an asset, and that's shown by assets going up by 600 euros. We bought it on credit. That means we didn't pay for it. We still owe the supplier some money, the 600 euros. And that debt that we owe the supplier is an account payable, which is a liability. Remember how we define liabilities is claims on assets from outside parties. The supplier has a claim of 600 against us. And so the accounts payable, which is a liability, they go up by 600. Hasn't affected equity at all. So assets are up 600, liabilities are up 600. Boris Industries sells this inventory for 1,000 euros cash. So what's happened? They've made some profit. So try to understand what's happening. First of all, the inventories are now disappearing. We've, paid, we've got rid of them, we've sold them, and so inventories go down by 600. And it goes down by 600 because that's how much the inventory level was. If you paid 600 for them and you've now sold them, they're back at zero. Just think, well, how much inventory do we have now? Answer, nothing. So it was plus 600 when we bought it, and now if you like on your income statement, the cost of sales, cost of goods sold is 600. We sold it for 1,000 cash, and so cash goes up by 1,000. And this is quite important because, first of all, it's completely objective. Um, you can see that it's a thousand that has come into the bank, a thousand euros has come into the bank. So there's no question cash has gone up by a thousand, but the number is different from the 600. So on the assets, you can see that they've gone up by a thousand from cash, but down by 600 on inventories. And overall, that's because they made a profit. The company's made a profit. Boris had revenues of a thousand, and costs of 600, and therefore gross profit of 400. Where does that go? Assets are up by 400. Therefore, the other, where does that go? It must go into equity, because no, no, there are no liabilities affected by that. And so you show it in retained earnings. Remember, go back to the diagram before, if you've got revenues up by 1,000, cogs up by 600, and therefore profit up by 400, that feeds in to retained earnings, ignoring dividends. That on its own means the balance sheet is now 400 bigger. The equity section is 400 bigger because we've now got that 400 additional value. And that's how this works. Let's do another example. And we can see how the balance sheet income statement and the cash flow statement interact. A company has a 31st of December year end and pays annual rent of 120,000 in advance on the 1st of October X1. Show how this would be reflected in the balance sheet, income statement, and statement of cash flows. So we've got here a timeline. Uh, I'm not going to draw too much on it because we're going to give the explanation in a minute. But I just want you to pause and think, what are we doing here? We are paying rent on 120,000 on a date three quarters of the way through the year. So there's the 1st of October, and we're paying it for the full year in advance. Now think about what's happening on the balance sheet. Uh, that's actually the hardest of the three. So let's start off with the cash flow statement. What's happened on the cash flow statement? 120,000. Are we showing part of that, all of that? Um, is it in or out? Or which of our three categories, operations, investments, and financing, do we think it falls under? Income statement 
is the accrual side. How much of that 120,000 should be reflected in the year 20X1? And then the balance sheet, what is the financial status at the year end as a result of this? So let's go through those three. In the income statement, 120,000 represents a full year from the 1st of October X1 through to 30th of September X2. How much of that was in the year 20 X1? Now you can see it's split across the two years. Now if you count the months, October, November, December, three twelfths or one quarter of that is rent for this year. So we're paying rent for a full 12 months of which three are in this year and nine are in next year. And therefore the income statement will show three twelfths or $30,000 of rental expense for this year. So try to understand, I've made the numbers as simple as possible. So it's 10,000 rent per month. And you can see that for X1, it's October, November, December, three months of rent at 10,000 each. It, under the accrual concept, the year 20 X1 has 30,000 of rental expense. The cash flow statement is the easiest of the three. That's saying what cash came in or went out, answer 120,000 went out. Is that operating, investing or financing? It's hopefully you can realize it's operating because it's part of the functioning of the business. It's not an investment. You're not buying a long-term asset here and it's not financing. It's nothing to do with the shareholders. So 120,000 operating cash flow would be CFO, cash flows from operations, and it would be an outflow reflected in that part of the cash flow statement. And then the balance sheet says, well, at the end of the year, we've still got a credit. We've still got this, the remaining amount. Now think of it as a prepayment card. Let's say you're going onto the tube in the morning, you've got, uh, and you're paying 120,000 for this, and every month it clicks down 10,000. How much is left at the end of that financial year? So on the 1st of October, we have this giant prepayment card. We've paid 120,000 on it, and think of it as a dial. We've charged it up, and it clicks down by 10,000 every month. The end of December, We've now used up three out of 12 months. It's gone down at $10,000 a month for three months, and it's gone therefore down from 120,000 down to 90,000. That's how much credit we've got left. And we know it's 90,000 because it's the remaining nine months of rent that we've prepaid that we haven't yet taken the benefit from. And so this, is it an asset or a liability or equity? Answer, it's an asset. And it's an asset because we have that benefit. Remember when we were describing the balance sheet, assets are positive resources that will bring value to the business. We can quantify it exactly because <clears throat> it's three quarters of the year. We have prepaid for using the office for the next nine months, and that is going to be worth $90,000. So that's, that goes on the balance sheet as a prepayment. So that's your basic answer. But you may be saying, Surely the balance sheet has to balance. How does the balance sheet balance? So let's go through this. Here's a little balance sheet diagram. Let's see what happens. First of all, we've put on, we've got this prepayment. And that is going in at 90. So we're adding 90 to assets. We have this 90,000 prepayment. Now, what about the cash flow statement? That's going to affect the cash balance. So here's cash on the balance sheet. That's going to go down by 120,000. So cash goes down by 120,000. Now, you, you may say, well, now total assets, that's gone down, it's gone up 90, down 120, overall is down 30. So overall assets are down 30. How do we fill the gap? Remember the rule, if you can't see instantly what to do, just think equity, income statement, what happened here? So we've incurred an expense, and that's the income statement, therefore all else equal, Retained earnings are down by 30. There's our income statement expense, and now you can see the balance sheet balances. So the income statement's dropped by 30, and the balance sheet balances. If you go back to the Boris example before, you'll see in both sides the balance sheet balances will always, always balance. If the balance sheet ever doesn't balance, we've done something wrong. The balance sheet will always balance. There you go, so that's how, the, that's how this example fits in. Now, before we conclude this section, just a basic idea on how accounting standards work. 
There are thousands and thousands of pages of rules dictating what, how accounting needs to take place. I've already described the, ob the object, sorry, the subjective nature of depreciation, how many years an asset's going to last. There are thousands of pages describing how you do depreciation, how you do every other number in the balance sheet and income statement, the cash flow statement. And these accounting standards are, uh, they need to be known in detail by the accountants who are putting the numbers together. They'll be known in detail by the auditors who are going to be, they are the organization that reviews the accounts and signs them off before they're published. And we need to have a basic idea of where these rules come from. We have an accounting standards board that writes them. Now, the, two, the, the most important one is the International Financial Accounting Set. These are the International Accounting Standards Board. The International Accounting Standards Board, IASB, and they write what are called International Financial Reporting Standards. The International Accounting Standards Board write the accounting standards that are accepted by the majority of financial markets. So literally, more around 120 countries around the world, including the whole of the EU, um, use IASB, uh, the IFRS, International Accounting Standards, uh, to produce all the accounts. And we'll get a very rough idea of some of these rules as we go, uh, but we're not gonna go into details on them. So that's the most important set of rules. Now, the one notable exception to this is the United States. US do not use IFRS, and they have their own, their own rules called US GAAP. So GAAP means generally accepted accounting standards, accounting principles rather, uh, generally accepted accounting principles represent the set of rules relating to a country. So when we say GAAP, or these accounts are GAAP compliant, it means they comply with the rules of that country. So when we say they are US GAAP compliant, it means they've been They've been put together using the US accounting rules. Um, IFRS and US GAAP, they're two slightly different sets of rules, but note that US does not use IFRS, uh, and that's the only big exception. Now, generally, over the last few decades, they have been getting closer together, but they differ in many fundamental ways. So as far as we're concerned, you need to be familiar with both. Um, although you may not be based in the US, you'll find that because that's the biggest equity market in the world, you certainly need to be familiar with some of the rules. So we're not going into the details of them, but the accounting standards describe the setup, describe how every transaction needs to be shown in the financial statements.